We call this meeting of the Assembly Budget and Finance Committee to order. Uh, we'll start with introductions. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Gates. Fred, Fred's here, I know. Okay. Alex Slifka, Chief Financial Fiscal Officer. Okay. Lance Wilbur, Office of Management and Budget. Felix Nevan, Forrest Dunbar. Eric Croft. Dick Great. And Austin? Great. And I know Fred is here. I hope he'll be joining us again. Uh, we have uh, some food in the back for anybody that wants it. Please uh, grab some lunch. And uh, we will start. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Slipka. So, uh, financial status update. Uh, the municipality is fine. Uh, <laughs> absent some operational uh challenges which we're working through. Uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, we did finish, I think, the final cash balance and uh, the controller's office is working with our auditor right now. Uh, we are on schedule to deliver to you a draft 2017 by the end of this month um, so that you can have that to inform your decisions. Uh, the audit won't be done, unfortunately, until the end of November. Um, to put it all in perspective, um, we have roughly $300 million in working capital, plus another uh, four to $500 million that flows in from taxes. Uh, and then on top of that, we have what uh, Lance will refer to as our 10 and our 2, but that's roughly $50 million of uh, unallocated cash that's there to support our AAA bond rating. Um, and plus we have another $135 million in various debt reserve accounts. So, the municipality really does have quite a bit of cash. Uh, we're not trying to make excuses for what happened in 2017, um, but uh, from a fiscal standpoint, uh, we are in good shape. I uh, will stop there and ask any questions. I've been joined by Mr. Dyson. Uh, any questions on this portion? Dick, for example, do you have any questions for the training? So where are we at on last on 2017 front balance? So we know? we know that it ended at a deficit of about 5.5 uh, .5 million, and remembering that that number includes roughly 2.7 million in settlements that were recovered in 2018. So when Lance starts his work with you talking about the budget we're presenting for 2019, it's going to start from that negative 2.7 million number. So 2017 now is completely closed down? Uh, I would say from a technical standpoint, I don't think it's exactly completely closed, but we are, we know, when we talk about the fund balance, we're talking about the major funds. We have another 100 plus other funds that we're still winding down, but those are minor in nature. Do we know when we're going to have 2017 closed down yet? Uh, we are, believe that that should be closed and done and out to the auditor by the end of the month. Okay. Send me an email. Let me know when that happens. Would you please? I will. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Any other questions for Mr. Slifka? If not, we'll go on to Mr. Wilbur and the budgets. Yes, Mr. Slifka? Well, I was going to say, if you wanted an update on revenue for 2018, uh, the treasurer, Mr. Morris here, could spend a few minutes telling you about where we are for 2018. Is, that, is now a more appropriate time than during Lance's presentation? Now's the best time. Dan? Mr. Okay. Moore? Uh, so I'm Dan Moore, City Treasurer. I'll make this real fast on revenues. Uh, we, uh, the the uh, picture is approved, so that's good news. Um, and uh, we are going to be slightly under uh, our revenue budget, but by not by a whole lot. It's $1.1 million. And about half of that is actually in the building safety fund. Okay? which is a, more of an autonomous fund. So if you subtracted out that, all of general government minus building safety, we'd be about a half a million dollars under our revenue budget. So that's, that's very good news. Um, there is, um, and that's our current projection. Um, the, the largest negative uh, for this year is $1.7 million. Uh, that's from state uh, municipal assistance. And that, uh, we were paid less than what we had budgeted, and that is a, uh, that's a known condition that's not gonna change. Uh, the second largest negative uh, variance is investment earnings. That one does change significantly from month to month. Uh, our current projection is that we will uh, be under budget $1.1 million. 
we we don't have control of the market, uh, but uh, but we are doing our best to invest it timely and to capture those higher rates as they go up. And in fact, that has been helping us over the last couple months. Uh, the picture on investment revenues has, has, has improved. Uh, it was just over the last month, it by half a million dollars. But there is volatility, and we cannot predict exactly how the year will end with investments. The two largest uh, positive variances are property taxes. It's $1.1 million. It's about half, half of that is personal property, half of that is real property. On the real property side, it's a direct reflection of some audit work that's been done uh, by, um, by the people on property appraisal. And they've, uh, they've found a number of cases where people were receiving exemptions, residential exemptions, senior exemptions, that really weren't entitled to the exemption. And so as a result of that audit, uh, these property owners are being billed for past exemptions they should have never received. And they are given the opportunity to uh, to respond and to you know uh, inform the city if, if we misinterpret something. But uh, but there's been there's been quite a few cases where uh, people have been found to be receiving it uh, and they should have. So uh, that's real and personal property, 1.1 million dollar positive. The other positive area that's large is uh, PFD garnishment. Every year at this time, uh, the Treasury in my division we we attempt to garnish. Um, a large population of people that owe for delinquent fines and fees. Most of these fines and fees relate to the police department. And uh, so our budget for that, um, basically we're going to come in $1.5 million over the revenue budget. And uh, we, we did everything we could to submit. We never know year to year how we're going to compete with the state, the IRS, and others. It happened to be a banner year for us. It's very good. Uh, the good news too is the one and a half million dollars. That is almost entirely revenues that go back to the police department. So, uh, so that's a very, very good story. The rest of the revenues are really uh, much smaller than the hundreds of low hundreds of thousands of dollars, plus or minus. There are a couple of the smaller ones that are that I just want to point out: uh, people mover bus fares. Uh, that is a four hundred thousand dollar positive variance. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the budget had to come way down on that, but. Uh, but they, uh, they actually will, will meet their budget and even and, uh, go beyond that, almost 400000 The other one is APD counter fines, uh, traffic tickets that are issued, and those are the ones paid timely at the uh, police department. It's about a $40 million positive variance there. So uh, that is it. Marijuana is still on track. It's going to be somewhere in that probably the low $3 million, $3.3, $3.4 million projection. Uh, so no major change there. Uh, fuel tax, which is a new tax that started this year, uh, is about a hundred thousand uh, dollars positive variance, and um, and that uh, it's our first year doing it. But uh, the person in Treasury that helps us build the projections, he does an excellent job, and he was very very close to his projection. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, so question. Some questions. So a question for Mr. Thompson and Mr. Train. Thank you. I don't know. If uh, Ms. Ross reached out to you. I had a constituent concern that was raised relating to the property tax exemption. A senior citizen who, uh, by virtue of his age and health, was forced into a assisted living home, and their family is unable yet to sell the property. And so he received a $6,000 bill for no longer residing at home. Have you heard about that case yet? I have not. And, and I will say, Treasury, we, we do send the bills, but the actual determination is done on the assessor side, the property appraisal. So I imagine Owen may have contacted the assessor. Uh, but I, I don't know. If you want to give me the name, I can follow up on it. So I'll have to do that. Okay, thank you. Tobacco mm -hmm. coming at that. Uh, oh, tobacco. Tobacco, we were holding steady right now. We're, we've seen a, a bit of a decline, about $200,000. Uh, so it's like $23 million. Uh, it's, it's in that range, yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're talking about real property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're going to be finding people that aren't, don't qualify for the exemption, but claiming it. So now we're going back to assessing them. Correct. Yeah. How far back do we go? They have some cases which go back, uh, gosh, three, four, five years. I mean, it can go back pretty far. Uh, so, but it, it varies by case. So Let me ask you a reverse that equation. If we have somebody that's being assessed for something that doesn't exist in the property, how far back can they go to get money back? To it's a uh, they it's a one year cycle refreshing cycle. So we go back yeah. multiple years. So they can only go back one year. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to work on that. Thank you for your question. Okay. Sure. Mr. Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Can you refresh my memory on how the fuel tax is structured? Mm -hmm. So with 100 million or 100,000 <coughs> positive variants, mm -hmm. where does that money go? Okay, it's an area-wide revenue, and uh, this year it's, uh, let's see, it's 10 months worth of, um, of revenue, so it's prorated. Uh, it's an excise tax, and all the fuel distributors basically file with us, we receive the money, and then since it is area-wide, OMB has the opportunity to apply to the budget in a pretty general way. It's not, it's not um, uh, designated, and it's not specific to any like particular source. Uh, we've been joining Mr. Weddleton. Mr. Weddleton, you have a question? So if um, the fuel tax is up, at some point it's dollar for dollar against property tax. Right. So does that kick in next year? Or how does I, that work? I, I believe, and Lance can confirm, but in the first, uh, first when we do mill rates, and even this year, we've, we factored in a pretty significant property tax offset directly because of fuel tax. So, yeah. And in every year, if it continues to go up, it'll continue to help the property tax be offset. So. But it, so if you're up in the fuel tax, we don't. It's not really. Oh, we have more money to spend. Because no, it's, property yeah, it's, tax, a, it's, a, it's a trade-off. Yeah, <coughs> but it does really help on property tax relief. Really. <coughs> so, okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Any other questions? All right, we'll go on to you, Mr. Wilbur. All right, I'm going to start with 2018. Um, Mr. Slifka talked about 2017. So at the end of September, we were 79% through the year. And taking a look at the department's expenditures, uh, both in their labor and their non-labor, overall, we're underspent. Their labor is pretty much right on track. Uh, their non-labor is um, uh, underspent. I think they're at about 68%. Um, they've encumbered some things, but they haven't completed the purchase of those. The departments that are on my list right now, frankly, the only one, um, and it's just a matter of allocating the money, is in P project management and engineering. Um, it's showing that they're over budget, and it's because they haven't actually moved their charges to capital projects in which the way they have to do that. So when that trues up, I expect them, I mean, they do a very good job there. But police and fire are pretty much on track. Allen group at project at uh, street maintenance. So I think they're going to come in um, under budget on their snow hauling, assuming it doesn't dump on Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and then, but right now, that the extra resources that we gave them this year, they're not, they haven't dipped into that this year at all. So <coughs> overall, all general government departments are looking, they're right on track, and um, we'll have a, a, a report to you through an AIM at a, at a different meeting. So that reminds me. So. Um, in the proposed operating budget, do we have that additional money for snow removal plans? We do not. Any other questions for Mr. Wilbur? So if I could talk about 19. Yeah. So on 19, we are um, scheduled to start our uh, work sessions tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Uh, Solid Waste has another presentation for you from 10 to 11. We are booked from 11 to 3. Um, I have a couple breaks in there. I visited with Barbara and uh, Desiree to make sure that we have an order that I think that, and then the timing, uh, which would be of interest to you. So hopefully you've all received, picked up your books. There's also a map available to you that we showed the capital projects on. So um, if you, uh, that's helpful or you want a, a smaller size or a different size you can use, just let me know. Um, tomorrow we're going to start with police, fire, transit, uh, project management and engineering, um, and then uh, traffic because I have a couple of directors that will be in other places. And we're going to finish with all of those departments that report to the municipal manager first. Then we'll start with Mr. Con uh, Mr. Uh, Schutte and all of his departments. And then um, if we don't get through every one tomorrow, what we'll do is we'll pick up those general government ones and we'll pick it up last uh, uh, on the 26th. So the format presentations will be the same. I'll be leading the presentations. I've asked directors to attend. Uh, if you have any specific questions on operations, they'll be able to address. If we can't address them then, then we'll follow up immediately thereafter. So look forward to starting the discussion tomorrow at 11. I believe we are upstairs, too. Um, in the mayor's conference room. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? Are we upstairs tomorrow? Um, Mr. Chair, let me confirm that. I believe that is correct. Okay, Mr. Turney? Keep in mind the parking's going to be just the way it is today. It'll be the same way tomorrow. So you get it right. Yes, Mr. Chair, you are in the mayor's conference room. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Mr. Wilbur? Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Fun time. All right, uh, Mr. Tamani. 
He's out here. He's out here. Maybe I could, uh, I could just say a couple words. I provided the Budget Advisory Commission the same presentation I gave you on an overview. Um, they're uh, working among themselves to find out how many more conversations they want to have about the budget. And so, um, as they as they work through um, their their meeting schedule, um, but I do expect a couple of them tomorrow to attend your work session with you. Good. Okay. All right. So we can go on to SAP. Ms. Marshall. Great. Do you have a presentation? Okay, so I brought lots of backup, so I think I'll be good this time. Uh, probably. Okay, so um, I'll just get down to it. Um, so this is just a reminder, when I took over in May, this was, when I took over as the acting director of IT, this was kind of, this was the structure of the SAP team. We had some core staff, but we had a large pool of uh, consultants working on the job. So the goal has been to try to get the knowledge transfer and, and to change this structure. So, so highlights since June. Um, I have new management in the SAP team. His name is Philippe Bryce. He's been there now for two months. Super excited to have him part of the team. Um, we have reduced our number of contractors from 23 to 13. We have pause on the new application management service support RFP. And so what that was, when I walked in, there was an RFP on the street. Actually, it was already on the street. They were collecting proposals for a new application management services support for SAP. So it would be a, a way to have new, um, a different theory, like a different group to provide consultants to help us as needed. And what we learned as, what I learned as we were going through this process is that we weren't really ready for this type of having this support because this type of support would require that our team was all knowed up and had all the all the knowledge that we'd be able to impart on our, uh, to inform our consultants on this new team to help us. And we would have to hire a consultant to teach the consultants. So it was like, well, let's pause on that. And we will focus on that next year once we get our, kind of our um, stuff together. Um, the other interesting is right now, SAP is hosted so that the actual application and all its support is hosted in a in a SAP uh, environment, so <coughs> HANA, HANA Enterprise Cloud. And what when we initially um, contractually agreed to go to this model, this remote um, cloud service model, they provisioned a whole bunch of servers that we didn't need. So. Right now we are in negotiations, and I think we've just finished them, hopefully last week, we've got a good number um, to reduce that number, so that means our billing costs will go down, and we're finalizing that dollar value. So we've been in negotiations on that as well. Um, and then we've also been working on a Solution Manager upgrade, and Solution Manager is the tool that manages all of our upgrades and um, keeps track of like when we made this change, it, we document how it impacts and what the details are. So it's, it's a way to have our knowledge, um, collective knowledge maintained and this tool is helpful. We had to upgrade it. So this is our, where we want to be. So the team is bigger, but we have a less reliant, uh, we have less consultants in the mix. And I showed you guys this before. I don't know if we need to go over it much, but overall, the green was existing staff, blue was new, and then we would still have a reliant on consultants, but only as needed, and hopefully um, that dollar value and cost will go down. So, um, you, and you feel free to ask me a question if you want now. I don't see anyone. So, where we're at now is we are trying to get our additional staff on board as soon as possible because of the funding. Um, 
the change up that we did two months ago it's allowing us to get these uh, job positions out in the street and it's taking us a while because the um, what would I say the, the ER process or HR process to getting a new position defined and published and posted takes a lot longer than I would have thought but here we are and we as of this week we are and hopefully they've been approved I got five positions and hopefully they'll go on the street tomorrow so so we're looking at probably two months cost of that and that would get us a report a report developer a training manager functional analysts are there's two of those one would be for the ER HR part of the tool and then one would be for the um, finance part of the tool the Philo versus HCM you'll see that quite a bit and then the other one is an interface lead that has been the interface lead has been a consulting position so we need somebody on the team that knows that and that we want to make sure we're retaining that knowledge um, okay so here's what the difference is so looking at this is what I promised you before um, here's our overview on our budget so in 17 um, we had quite amount of we had a large 20 million and capital costs for development and those are that was consultant effort uh, 2018 we're at like a 1.5 million on that and the 19 no more capital costs on that effort um, overall we had a 2017 budget or a expense of 26 million 18 we're down to 12 19 we're down to 9 and hopefully the 19 number and probably the 12 number will go down based on our current nego excuse me, negotiations with the hosting center to reduce that cost. It could, it could give us a reduction of $40,000 a month. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. Um, just looking, so yeah. in, in that capital cost, it's like you look in 18 and you got over $5 million for consulting and not as much. 70, but that 20 million included lots of SAP consultants. There's right. a lot of labor. In there. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was mostly, it really was labor. So we didn't really go out. You mean, oh, you mean the in the 18? Oh, right. Because it was, it's capitalized versus right. operating. Yeah. I understand what your question is. Yep. Uh, Susie, if yeah? you project this, maybe you can't, but if you project that 2020, 2021, would we expect a consulting number to hold steady at about that or to continue? I'd like for it to go down for sure. Yeah, I think it should go down. And then our hosting costs, we are um, looking at a different way to do hosting. And so um, our cost should go substantially down on that too. Can you remind us where those servers are physically located? San, I think, I'm gonna, I was going to say San Antonio, Texas. I, I think it's uh, San Jose, California. Sorry, it's California. It's, it's in the United States which is a big deal because a lot of hosting places put you like in Mexico or in um, not in the US because <laughs> it's cheaper and so with our requirements we want to make sure that we, we call them FedRAMP compliant so FedRAMP compliant would mean they have US workers in the and they would have the physical facility on US soil. Question I hadn't thought about before, but what happens if the earth shakes and the lines go down and our workers want to get paid? Right, that's a great question. Um, right now, the, the whole, um, I say company, but I would say our entire organization, IT included, every organization is working through a disaster recovery plan and making what is priority and how are we going to do it if an if a, a <coughs> incident is to happen. I can't tell you exactly how the payroll people would work their part, but in related to IT, the the one um, if the disaster is here and all of our power is out and we have no connection outside the out, um, I'm not exactly sure because that would impact banks as well. So I don't know how that process would work. Um, but if the accident is or if the incident is where our hosting center is, there is a um, they have a model where they replicate it across the U.S. So there's like two centers there. Mr. France? Does that answer your question? Good okay. Mr. France? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so um, in future years, we can expect the overall cost of maintenance to go down. Yes. Would the area of um, risk still be consulting as far as like what could jeopardize that 
downward trend of the operational costs, or is there another area that could um, end up being an upward pressure? Um, I, I still would see it as consulting. I think we really just got to get our staff tuned in and know where we are. And I think I'm not sure how long it took with with PeopleSoft. I don't know what that timeline was, but um, I mean we're going to manage it way closer than um, well. I'll just say we will manage it closely, and we will um, try to make sure everybody's updated as we understand the risks. All right. We good? Yeah. Uh, okay, fourth quarter is what we're doing. So we are we do have a upgrade happening right now. Um, this was something we well anyway it became uh, brought to our attention a little late in the game, but we're dealing with it. Apparently the the actual application had not been upgraded the base since 2013, and to get our HR. Um, HR upgrade installed, which means you're getting all the latest tax stuff you're doing. You just got to, you know, we have all those legal requirements to pay, do all of our filings, and to do all that, we had to upgrade the base app. So it's a much bigger upgrade than we um, than was originally anticipated. But we're on it. I think we're getting it worked out. We're going through a big testing process. We have project managers involved, and anyway, I think we're we're staying very focused, and right now it's staying on target. So I think that's really good. Um, our release change management. We continue this new process. Where right when I started, we started a new. Um, it, it was a lot of. Before I started, there was a lot of fires. Fire, quick, put this out. It's an emergency. Quick, and there was wasn't a lot of coordinated of change releases of releases upgrade. And so now we are on a monthly cycle. It's a little pause right now because we're doing the upgrade, but we, we're sticking to that cycle, and it seems to be working better. That way we can make sure when we do a change, we have five changes that happen at once, we let them um, interact in a test environment to make sure we understand the impl implications when we go into production. Uh, hiring staff is what we're doing right now. Um, knowledge transfer, we have these consultants and we, are, we, are, we have directed them all that we need all their information updated in this new uh, solution manager and we also know that we are getting our team to work with the consultants more so that we have more knowledge transfer um, the cost the heck cost reductions could be is we're estimating that to be like 350,000 per year reduction based on our negotiations um, we're supporting just the SAP vendor, how we're going to support our efforts with the consulting, and I think we've figured out all that. So the vendor we have now will be providing our consultants in the near term for 2019. So I think we have a really good handle on those costs and our support. And then, as I said, solution manager. Um, and then 2019, so we're going to expand our hiring efforts to meet the team plan. We are. Um, going to try to, we're going to scope out and hopefully the, the solution will be after we scope it out is to move our server onto on-prem, onto prem, onto the on-premises, which means we wouldn't have SAP hosted somewhere else. There's pros and cons to all of those things and that's what we'll be evaluating in the beginning of the year before we just decide we're going to do this change. Um, but if we do that, it would be substantial cost reduction overall. Would you just, say move yeah. on premises in time the servers or something else yeah. and the servers where in anchorage would they physically be located they would be physically located in our new uh, data center which is in uh, gci co-location facility they call it the sad c center which i think is physically over off the international airport area road i, I haven't been there but i think that's how it's been described to you. Sure. Good. yeah Ms. Uh, yeah so you won't move it to where asd servers are located on fort ridge and they've already got a data center there I don't know about the Fort. What, what is the Fort Ridge? Oh, the ASD you said. Yes, ASD's oh. got a big data set. Have you been there? I have not been there. You might want to look at there because they were talking before about having servers for us there. Oh, I didn't know about that. Okay, I'll check it's it out. It was a military school. They turned in the ASD's website or their service center. Okay, I'll check it out. Interesting. All right. But we want to make sure we're scoping it. We're not just doing it. That's what I'm trying to make sure our team is looking at all the ramifications before we just go. Um, we'll probably have another ECC upgrade that happens in June, and that's the SAP base, um, and then we'll have another HR pack 
for next year in December, which should, should be very easy and quick because we're going through this hard, lengthy process now. It should be much better next year. Um, and then we'll look at putting out another RFP for an application services uh, support, um, application management services support contract. So we, theory by the middle of next year we should have enough knowledge on staff to be able to look at our consulting model and change it and maybe get a better price on all of our support and we're going to focus on training reports interfaces are kind of a, a thing interfaces is when you you are um, like for example when we do payroll you you need to make sure you're also sending uh, money to the benefit company or that you know who's ever managing it so that would be an interface and so there's been some challenges on that level of support and we want to make sure we're, we got all those tuned in. Right now we have like 80 interfaces and I just want to make sure they're all up and running and we're not doing, um, apparently we're doing a lot of workarounds. I want to stop that. Um, and then making sure we can do reporting because that's the other big stress. And then there's some additional tools and solution manager that should make everyone's life easier, but we have to implement them and that takes time. Okay. Is that the end of your presentation? Yeah, I think that's it. Yep. All right. Any questions for Ms. Marshall before we go on to payroll questions for Mr. Fultz? <coughs> yeah, Ms. LaFrance. Thank you for the time. <coughs> Very yeah. much appreciated. So yeah. for the five positions that you're starting the recruiting process with, yeah. basically you're understanding that the uh, local market people could be able to hire local folks for those positions? I, I think so. For the really... Um, SAP, the, the real high level um, people, we've got some, con we, ha we have a line on people that want those jobs. So I think we've been working it hard on our channels to talk to people. Um, so we think we have a way to advertise and get the right people in. Um, we also are looking at, there's a support group, SAP support group, um, and we're going to want to put stuff out there. <laughs> uh, Mr. Trainee. Okay, as your advertising positions, yeah. would you please put on their SAP qualified whatever standard you want? I don't want somebody coming in here to do this that's not SAP qualified. Right. Yes. Otherwise, it's just shooting us back. Agreed. In the beginning. Yeah. If you can't speak SAP, then they shouldn't be applying for the job. Totally agree. Sure, it's one says hard. Yeah. No, we did. Um, we did. I think a very good job at getting some good. Um, job descriptions put together. We had a couple different vendors who offered to help us do that. Um, anyway, they, they, they're very thorough and I think they're, it's, it's a, I think it's a, we've done a well, a good job. So. Other questions, Mr. Constant? Yeah, so you mentioned the 2013 HR bill or software bill. Is that when we bought this program, 2013? I think we paid wasn't it, when did it start, 11, 10? Okay, so Something like that. Probably. 10. That but the build, the, I was surprised that we were on a 13 build myself. So to learn that and then that would, if we didn't upgrade the base, then we couldn't do the incremental update and it was just a bigger thing once, you know, it's like picking up a rock and you're like, oh, there's another snake. Okay, let's hit it and let's do it. And I do think our team is at least owning it and doing it and I, I think we're, it'll be okay. Okay, thank you, Ms. Okay. Marshall. Uh, Mr. Falsey, do you have an update on the payroll? I do. Do you have a PowerPoint? I do not. Oh. No. <laughs> a really big show. Out of character. I do not have a PowerPoint this week, uh, and that's the first part of the update. Uh, in part because uh, the story is not different right now. Um, I mentioned last time when I gave the update that the big push would be to get the several defects fixed in release four, and that's where payroll has been focused. So they pushed half a dozen defect corrections in R4 last week. They're pushing two more today. We've got a few more that are still coming. The upshot of correcting all those lingering defects in release four and in the additional defect corrections that we're looking to push through as emergency transports even beyond release four, that we will have configured the machine to largely plow through those 1,400 payroll corrections that are still in a defect status. I also said that we were going to be cross-training 
up most of the payroll department and assigning them a couple hours a day or more to turn through pay corrections so that we can finally clear this backlog that has begun. Two folks were crossing yesterday and started plowing through those pay corrections yesterday. But that is a new development beyond when I was able to get new data because we were focused on R4 before. So the update I wanted to meaningfully give you this time was more on the improved communication. So I asked our employee relations department to coordinate with payroll and with IT to say, let's make sure that everyone says we're all on the same page here. So David Peterson, our labor relations specialist, sent to each union, here is our current understanding of all the outstanding defects that need to be fixed in the system that affect your members, and here is the plan and the timeline for when we're going to correct them. We did get some questions about the timing from a few, but the only, we got one union who said you missed some, and that is IBEW. Dusty is here. I am told that David Peterson is going to give you a formal response today, but we deeply dove into each and every one of those. Probably in the interest of everyone that we have a separate meeting where we can compare notes, but we're way in the weeds on these. We got folks saying, like, if you work double time and you code your time to two different things and your meal period may populate incorrectly. I think that one's being fixed today. Renee's shaking her head there. Uh, we've got some schedule issues which may relate to the CBA. I think we can fix that out. There was one employee who was having a problem with holidays on the 12-hour schedule. We, the employee that we've been following, we think it's working for, but if you've got a different employee, we should have all to figure out what's going on. In any event, I think we are keenly interested in making sure we all see the same thing. So. Dusty, if we want to find an hour, happy to find an hour. Um, other than that, I think I should be able to give you better information when we next meet, now that we are through the R4 push, and it does look like we are making incremental progress. Mr. Train, any questions? Mr. Chairman, can we ask Dusty in two minutes to give his version of what's going on? I wonder if then, if we have people for 2017, their payroll is still not correct. Okay. And we're talking a lot of tax issues and fines they can, because of labor negotiations, it's like $50 a day. We don't want to do that. I'd like to leave chair <coughs> from them from their perspective. Let's see if there are other some members with questions for Bill first. And if there aren't, then I'm happy to hear from Dusty or anything additional from Bill. Uh, Mr. Weddleton? Can you address the $50 a day comment? Yeah, and in fact, that was my question too, like, what's our strategy? Right, so uh, as we started this, iterative process now many months ago. The first time I put each of the collective bargaining agreements, errors and pay sections up on the board. We can do that again next time if you like. They, each of the nine collective bargaining union, collective bargaining agreements have a different error and pay provision. Some of them have a $50 a day penalty. Some of them have four hours of straight time. One of them has eight hours of straight time. Some of them are triggered by a failure to pay correctly full stop. Some of them are triggered by a failure to pay correctly after central payroll has been notified about the error and they didn't fix it within a certain amount of time. Some of them are triggered by central payroll being told and then uh, they don't have a specified time in which to fix it, only they have to verify it, and then that starts on the clock. Suffice to say, some of the penalties, all of it is a negotiation. So there, our going forward strategy to work with the unions has been to see how we can come to some kind of accommodation that resolves the error in pay potential liabilities. I think largely uh, using some kind of non-cashable leave approach. Um, because some of the penalties that are in the collective bargaining agreements, which have been there for some of them dating back to the 70s, seem wildly out of proportion to the actual injury that folks have actually suffered. Um, and I think that we're going to be successful in coming to some reasonable accommodation because any amount of money that we actually push out through that process is only going to eat in to the municipal coffers and cause more problems for the very employees who might well otherwise be on the receiving end of those. So we. We are working through those. There are uh, numerous grievances all in various stages of the process, step one, step two, um, and we're hoping to resolve them in a way that is fair and beneficial to everybody without causing significant disruptions. Okay, I must have follow up to that. So we had, this, this issue has been raised a number of times for the last however many months we've been dealing with this, and uh, years perhaps, but the $50 a day, the, the sort of, the, the penalties, and I had expressed, I think a number of other people had expressed near the beginning of that, that as we go forward with additional labor negotiations, that we were going to put in into our 
try to negotiate into our upcoming contracts things that require negligence or some other trigger other than just, hey, our giant IT platform is messing up with us and we can't do, we're trying as hard as we can and we still can't do this correctly. Has that happened? Um, has employee relations been actively bargaining to try to create um, you know, more negligence-based or sort of nefarious action-based penalty clauses? The answer is yes, and I am Googling because I think it has already even showed up in one of the agreements that went to you. But if it hasn't, I believe it will be. I, 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 there's a, I, have a, I have a memory that it did go into one of them, but I'm not sure. Owner is shaking her head. Do you have any additional? No, I know that we part, made it part of the negotiations and at least one of the ones that has come across. But oh, there's someone, ma'am? Uh, Renee Barrett, I'm acting apparel director. Um, it got into the L71 contract that just closed in late August, I believe. Great. And that's something that we're actively trying to work on every upcoming? As far as our number one labor relations is actively trying to do that, it is a negotiation. Right. But yes, they are trying. Just because we try doesn't mean we necessarily get it, but I think it's something that we realize is of particular value given we are at the mercy of this, you know, monolith of SAP. Uh, so, um, Mr. Trainee, you would ask that uh, Dusty have a chance to speak with us. IBW, I'd like to just tell IBW in two minutes what they're perceiving as selling the problem. Dusty, do you, do you want to speak? On. Could you uh, come forward and identify yourself for the record? And yeah, go two minutes. Dusty Minofi, I'm the uh, chief steward for Municipal Light and Power. Um, as uh, Bill said, Dave Peterson sent us an email uh, the ninth, gave us a list of issues. I sent him back a response. I there was another five issues to the ten that he had sent me that I'm aware of. There may be more. Not 100 percent on that. Most of these issues have been since the very first paycheck. Some of them are substantial, some of them are overpayments. Um, I can think of a group of 30 employees who get overpaid. If you add it all together, somewhere between seven dollars and $10,000 every paycheck. Not each employee, but as a total, overpayment. So I mean, these employees are set somewhere between seven dollars to $12,000 overpayment as of today because the check they get tomorrow will still be overpaid. I have underpayments that happen on the first check that have not been corrected, or if they have, there is no way to know they were. I mean, the initial pay corrections that they were doing, it was literally nonsense. They put X amount in your check, took X amount back out, and it looked like it did nothing for your check. I mean, it was almost identical. They had no mechanism to track what they were correcting. They were just randomly correcting things. I had employees leave where they tried to correct their paycheck and overpaid them several thousand dollars and I would call and say, hey, you overpaid this guy three grand. They're like, no, it's correct and never fixed it. If people left, you got underpaid. Um, at this point, I think the only way to really know would be to audit each individual employee. I've asked the question a few times. I know we let our licenses lapse for Kronos to just use it as a calculator. Put in everyone's payroll for the last year, hit the button, it dumps out a total for all your benefits, all your wages, because it seemed to work pretty much. I mean, it had errors, but nothing like this. Uh, the excuse I was given was they didn't want to put anything into uh, Kronos because they didn't want to use it into the payroll. We put it on a separate machine that wasn't attached to anything and just used it as a calculator. That was my first advice. Um, no one said we could do it. I, I, that's an option because an audit would be very tiny and very expensive. It would probably be easier to do that than an audit. Um, with our interaction with the municipal attorney on our grievance that we have, what well, without sounding rude, it seems like they're trying to get out of paying any errors in pay. And to speak to what uh, Forrest said, the errors in pay language is simply just to make sure employees are paid correctly each paycheck. At no point did we expect you to buy a payroll program that didn't work for, well, a year. It's, it's kind of preposterous. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. There's a lot of upset employees, and I mean, they're at a point where they're irate, and this merger that's going through currently with municipal like power and CEA, the question I keep getting is, are they gonna fix this before we're sold? That's the big question on everyone. That's pretty much all I got. Okay, uh, Mr. Weddleton, you had a question? Um, how do you know about the payroll errors? Do they, 
uh, they come to you and say, hey, I have an error, or are you I, I looking for these employees. I'm the guy they call and yell at when the check is wrong. So there could be people on mistakes. They don't know. There's these, so Some of the you. errors were uh, data entry into the system. Like if you work out of class, you literally have to go check a box and say, I'm working out of class today. Is this? And some people don't do it and don't get paid. That is probably not an SAP error. That is a personnel error. But there are several errors, uh, the meals, uh, call outs, holdovers, um, overtime, shift differential. It, sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. It depends on what kind of shift you're on. But, but you won't know about an error unless someone tells you, hey, Unless someone me calls me and talks to me, that's correct. Uh, the majority of the people who call me a lot are the temporary employees because they're there for six months to a year and a half, and then they leave, and they want to make sure their check is right with me. Okay, good, thanks. Mr. Falsey, do you have any thoughts on the Kronos idea that best be raised? Uh, not immediate thoughts, but I'm happy to discuss it. I mean, we should get together and figure this out and figure out what the best way for it is. And I think I mean, we're all people of goodwill. We all want to get this fixed. We all want to get it fixed as fast as possible. So if that's the right way to do it, we'll explore that out. It would seem like an easy way. I don't know if it's right. <laughs> it's just a thought. Okay. Any other questions for Dusty or for Bill? Thanks. Thank you, Dusty. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, well, with that, uh, we have time for audience participation, and then um, any other comments from assembly members? Any other things you want to raise? Okay. Anyone from the audience wish to speak? No? Okay. We will close this uh, committee early. We're adjourned.